Hi, John Helmer here. I've had some really great feedback about not only the content of our podcasts, but also their technical quality. So it's slightly annoying that I have to say a word of apology about the crackling and popping on my mic in this episode. Hopefully it won't diminish your enjoyment too much. Hello, I'm Kate Fitzgerald from the Learning Hack team, welcoming you to the latest episode of Great Minds on Learning. This season is brought to you by Learning Pool, the company that helps you deliver exceptional performance with pioneering online learning platforms, creative content and powerful analytics. In this series, Donald Clark, the internationally famous author, blogger and entrepreneur, joins John Helmer to explore two and a half thousand years of thought and theorising about learning from the Greeks to the geeks. This episode brings us into the computer age. We meet the thinkers who explored how computer and internet technology could best be used for learning. They mapped how online media should be combined in learning programmes and showed us how to design online experiences with users in mind. Meet the online educators. So, Donald, with this episode, we move into the era of technology and learning. Chronologically speaking, this group of thinkers spans the years from the early experimental years in the 1760s, 70s, 80s and 90s through the so-called Cambrian explosion of e-learning in 2000 or thereabouts to the learning technologies industry as we know it today. Um, So some of these people are still working and writing and appearing on conference platforms. But before you give us a general introduction to the group, Donald, perhaps we should go back further to the roots of online learning and learning theory. Time for an origin story. Yes, in many ways, this issue, how do you apply a learning theory when you're using technology? And remember, technology includes things like language, printing, (laughs) you know, the pencil with the little eraser, and then paper, pens, all that's technology in a way. And way back to Plato, we had uh, reflections on whether writing and technology was a good thing or not. So it's been an evergreen topic for the last two and a half thousand years. But today we're going to focus very much on, you know, a selection of people uh, who were really coming into the 20, well, late 19th century, uh, really into the 20th century when computer technology took off and, of course, the internet. So, you know, we're going we're gonna to cover people like Papert, who uh, a constructionist, not a constructivist, who was very much about using technology to learn physically, as it were. Then we have the magnificent mayor who uh, has 500 plus studies uh, in learning, who really has given us the research base upon which to design this stuff. Uh, beyond mayor, we have two, two researchers I really love in their book, The Media Equation, with 35 studies and that's Nass and Reeves from Stanford, the basis of how we react with computers, how we react with learning on the screen. We treat it almost as a human being, almost Socratic. We can't help that. And then we'll end on the godfathers of uh, design, really, and interface design and usability, and that's uh, Norman and Nielsen. So this is a representative sample. There are hundreds of theories in this area, but it's given us a good sweep through the main topics, uh, I think. Uh, so that's what we'll focus on today. Hundreds of theorists around, um, and quite a lot of them I've noticed are doing my research called Clark, which is very confusing. Um, but one Clark who doesn't feature in this uh, these lists generally is yourself, Donald. You're much too modest to put yourself into it. But I think we can't really um, leave the, 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 the introduction here without mentioning the fact that you've got a book out at the moment, quite an important book on learning experience design. So... Um, I think you should put a quick plug in for that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, this particular podcast is close to my heart because this is a topic I've, you know, it's been my life. I've been involved in building companies in this area. I did it for a living for uh, nearly 30 years. And uh, so, that, and I've just finished literally this book, which is, uh, it was published in the 3rd of November. So you can get that on Amazon. So, you know, this is a topic I, I really love. It's, it's my life as it were. So yeah, thanks for that, John. I, you know, for that little uh, allowing me to plug my book. <laughs> uh, word from our sponsor there. So, Donald, when did people first start to think about building technology on the back of learning theory? 
A good question. I think I think that goes back to Bab you know, Babbage comes up with this calculating machine. I think that was a really pivotal moment in 1882 when when computers started to do useful things for human beings, as it were. It was a, a computing machine, albeit mechanical. This paves the way for computer-based learning. Uh, but there are two big names really early on. In fact, in the late 19th century, you had a, a, a couple of well, a whole flock of patents around this, but none of the patents included learning theory. People were building little machines to improve spelling and also general knowledge and so on. But the first recorded application of a patent with learning theory in it was a guy called uh, Aikens in 1911. And he had a spelling machine. It's quite a clever little machine, actually. And he quoted Thorndike, uh, the famous transfer behaviorist guy who we covered in another po uh, podcast. But this really sprung into life a little bit later. So that was in, in 1911 uh, with the famous teaching machines. So we had uh, a guy called Pressy, uh, Sidney Pressy, who came up with the idea just before the First World War. But it, uh, the, the, pay, uh, the teaching machine was thought of uh, in, in 1915, but it was 1926 when Pressy filed the patent uh, and built the first machine that really was built upon quite a clever learning theory. He was not a behaviorist. What he did was build a machine to deliver content, accept input from the learner, and then deliver feedback uh, uh, to the learner. And I would say that Pressy is really the, the true originator. The first teaching machine, as it were, was his. And he used old typewriter bits, you know, keys and so on, to build multiple choice questions. Very, very clever little mechanical machine. But he understood that machines, these machines could be used for both teaching and learning. And he wrote a lot about this, that you could set the machine using a simple lever, lever so that the learner would only move on when they got the right answer, the idea of building knowledge across time. That was a part of Pressy's machine here. And his pedagogic arguments, which he wrote about, was that these machines are quick. They give immediate results to both the teacher and the learner. You don't have to wait days to get the stuff marked. It takes away the drudgery of marking from the teacher. And a really important point from Pressy was that it could free teachers up to do proper teaching you know, rather than just simple marking and assessment, retrieval practice and so on. And you could quickly reset the machine for the next student and so on. He even came up with his own definition of blended learning, I think called a adjunct, I forgot, adjunct auto-instruction, he called it. And uh, so he was really quite an advanced thinker on this front. Hmm. And then about 40 years le later with Skinner, who comes along with his teaching machine, uh, that's perhaps better known than Press, he's called Glider, uh, called Glider in 1954. But again, to be fair to Skinner, although he's a behaviorist and takes behaviorist learning theory to the machine, it's quite sophisticated. It has these sort of discs like uh, old vinyl uh, singles and on the radii of the discs are questions and the, as the disc rotated it would show a question in a little window on the machine this yellow box but on the right hand side there was an open input question you can actually write your answers it's quite advanced that uh, you hardly any online learning even today accepts open input like that from uh, from students but again it's important to remember that skinner saw this as alleviating the pressure on teachers providing so active learner, good feedback, uh, scoring and so on, so that, so that the learner could become more autonomous and independent from the teaching process, which frees the teacher up and is helpful for the student. And also the step-by-step -step synthesis towards more complex ideas was part of Skinner's uh, thing. So we have those two tethering figures really in terms of early teaching uh, and learning technology that were built upon good learning theory. And that's really what we want to address with a series of uh, learning theories today. So thanks, that gives a good introduction, sets the, the background for those we're yeah. covering today. I think so, yeah. So Seymour Aubrey Papert, 1928 to 2016, so died fairly recently. Seymour Papert was a South African born American mathematician computer scientist and educator, studied at Johannesburg and Cambridge in England, anti-apartheid activist and a bit of a revolutionary socialist in the 50s, a protege of Piaget, that's difficult to say, spent most of his career at MIT, pioneer of AI. His experiments with building small mobile robots in the logo programming language came out of his constructionist ideas. Uh, we've got to, got to be careful here. There's also constructivism and 
connectivism, but this is constructionism. And how did those ideas feed into his work on learning? Yes, so constructionism, it's a very interesting learning theory, this, and really Papert invented this. It's now sort of called maker theory, learn by doing and so on. But it's a very clever idea. And the, the, the idea is that you, that technology basically creates its own pedagogy. It's not just learning, then you build the technology. Sometimes technology comes along that has, creates new pedagogy. And in his case, he built, uh, you know, it's, it's a, even his name Mindstorms is even in those little Lego, incredibly expensive Lego kits that you might have bought for your children. Mindstorms was the name of Papert's book, which explained this theory. And the, the theory really is that you learn by building stuff and doing things rather than from uh, learning a whole load of cognitive theory and knowledge first and then going on to apply it. He, in a sense, flipped it and reversed it. So that's what he means by, and we mean by constructionism. You're constructing things, literally using your hands and then cognitively working out how they work, experimentation and so on. He thought that uh, children le should and do learn through play. Uh, and this is, uh, this is actually modern cognitive science has shown that this is absolutely true as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, he was ahead of his time on that, on that front. But what he does is he builds a programming language called Logo. And those of us who were around then remember that. And you could program your little robot uh, using Lego or whatever uh, 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 to build the robot. And it would do things and perform functions which you as a godlike learner had created. And it was a marvelous feeling. You know, you type something in and it does what you tell it. Uh, that's the, the marvelous thing about programming. And of course, he co-founded the, the famous artificial intelligence lab uh, with Marvin Minsky uh, at MIT. Uh, along with the media lab as well. So you had a, you know, a finger in that pie uh, in terms of the shaping of learning experiences. He was also involved with the One Laptop Per Child program um, with Negroponte, wasn't he, which came out of MIT? Yes. In a way, this was an attempt. I mean, I think it was a worthy attempt that to, to recognize that education wasn't just something with computers. That it wasn't something that should be applied to the developed world only. Uh, you know, they took, they were deeply interested in spreading the word and spreading the technology. So they invented this cheap, robust little uh, sort of greenish laptop that they then started to experiment with uh, going into Africa, especially. It didn't end well. And it didn't end well, really, because Negroponte turned it into a private company and became, uh, you know, it became his project and he was making a lot of money from this. And of course, uh, there was a lot of hype and exaggeration, uh, especially around the projects in Ethiopia that I did some research into. So they claimed that, you know, that the kids in this remote town who had never read any print before had hacked the, the computer. They hadn't. They had just switched the, the on-off button a couple of times to reset it and so on. So it, it died through its own uh, PR, really, in many ways. But there's still projects like this. And also, it was a bit device fetishy. You know, and I was just give them devices. That will solve the problem. Well, no, this is actually about learning. And actually, probably what really matters is the software, not the devices. The hardware will come. And that has come to pass, of course. But mm. going, you know, to stick to Pap Papert uh, uh, for a minute here, the Logo Turtle, the Mindstorm kits, this idea of the child who actively builds things, uh, not only builds things, but learns the skills as they build and then learns those skills and works through experimentation to apply their knowledge and skills by seeing something happen. That's quite exciting. Very different from sort of just discovery learning. Uh, it, you're actually doing something, learning by doing. So I think that was a, a really important contribution here. And uh, if you have a child, they probably love Lego. They probably love building robots. Mm. Uh, they love doing all sorts of things or mindstorms or whatever, uh, 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 mindstorm kits uh, uh, that you bought for them. So there are all sorts of things that that have been proven to be correct on the back of Papert's insights. Does it translate to adult learning? Yes, I think this idea of learning learning through building thing. We had the maker movement, you know, that came along with yeah. 3D printing and so on. And I think it's certainly the case. I mean, my son, who has a degree in AI, he has, a, he has one of those printers. And in a sense, many of the practical skills around building parts for a drone and all this sort of stuff, uh, he's learned by doing. There's some things in the world you have to learn by doing and not from the book or the manual. And so I think it's had a, a resurrection because with things like 3D printing and the sort of things you can buy now that 
in a sense, take advanced manufacturing into your own home for something like a couple of hundred dollars. That's, uh, that's been the modern manifestation of that. So next, Richard E. Mayer, 1947 um, yes. to now, still among us, American educational psychologist, distinguished professor of psychology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, has made a significant contribution, contribution to theories of cognition and learning, and most famous probably for his multimedia learning theory. Multimedia, a word we used here all the time in um, yeah. learning in the old days, and now it's, it's like one of those terms like new media. People know, don't use it anymore because the media isn't that new anymore. But this stuff is very central to the world that you and I have lived in for the last 20 years, Donald, in, in learning technologies. Yes. Um, and his work's absolutely central. Mayer's work's absolutely central to the work of an online learning designer, I would have thought. Yeah. We've covered a lot of theorists already that will be, certainly help an instructional designer to have read. You know, they should know about cognitive load and stuff like that, and cognitive psychology in general. But looking at your blog post about Mayer, Donald, it seems to me that maybe you shouldn't let a learning designer anywhere near a piece of online learning <laughs> until they've read Mayer. Would that be your view? Well, that, I agree with that. I think it's almost a necessary condition for success to, to read this stuff because... He was the first with over 500 studies, 500 plus studies. The famous book, the first book is still massively relevant today. And that was e-learning and the science of instruction that was written in 2003 with uh, Ruth Clark, another Clark there. Okay. Uh, uh, and there some, what was nice about Mayer's research is they uncovered some basic principles that a learning designer or someone uh, managing learning technology could apply. Those basic principles were the use of multimedia. In other words, how do you use multimedia? when you're building learning technology or online learning or offline learning, right? Also, a contiguity, in other words, where do you place things on the screen? Make, don't put your labels over here. They have to be right next to the thing that you're talking about. It seems trivial, but it's true. And many, many people made this mistake. Modality, redundancy, in other words, people just put too much stuff on the screen. You know, if you put text on the screen, cut it, cut it till it bleeds, cut it again. So that notion of redundancy, far too many uh, illustrative graphics that don't really add to the learning. They just clog up working memory. So that's redundancy. Coherence was another one and consistency ac across the piece. And then also personalization, which he, he researched in some detail. And lastly, uh, what was his final one again? Oh, yeah, practice opportunities. So practice was another big deal for, for me. Okay. Now, what he does is proper control studies so that you have something to go on here, you know, rather than just armchair theory, which many of the others there. And what he'll do is give you a rating. In other words, he'll look at the number of studies in this field and say, well, this is valid because five out of six studies say that this actually works with real learners. So he'll tell you the number of papers in the field. He will tell you how certain you can be or give you a probability figure about why you should be applying this. And of course, he does his own research himself around coherence, things like signaling, you know, highlighting words, using arrows on the screen, all the sort of things that people think are a bit clumsy, but actually work. Uh, and the you know, there are several big ones that we could perhaps focus down on here. Uh, I, think, I think the big one for me is redundancy. And you know, that's a, avoid eye and ear candy. You know, if you talk about ear candy, forget about background music and beeps and bobs and clapping and all that sort of stuff. So get rid of that. It's not necessary. In fact, it's harmful as he showed in his experimentation. So there's the ear candy, but the big one is eye candy. In other words, don't over-engineer or over-egg your graphic design. Uh, you know, keep it simple, pair it back. Learning is not entertainment. Uh, and he did loads of research on this, showing that diagrams, for example, shouldn't be, you know, full color. If you're going to say, if you're going to do something physics, don't have to show a, a picture of a golfer and a ball pinging off the tee and so on. All of that adds to the load. Keep it simple, mm -hmm. almost black and white. Build the graphic step by step. Think about learning first and not how beautiful it looks on the screen because the that, that beautification sometimes damages the learning. Mm -hmm. Text and simple. On media, his big message there is that media rich is not mind rich. You know, don't imagine that you have to have all this singing and dancing, animation and effects and even video. Text and simple graphics will often suffice so that the learner can go at their own pace. 
uh, text and animation. He was saying, be very careful with animation. It can be mm -hmm. difficult to use and expensive. And then there was a whole load of stuff about audio and graphics that you shouldn't have text on the screen while somebody reads it at the same time because they are two separate channels into the brain. And what you can't do is deal with both. So you get cognitive dissonance and therefore you that inhibits learning. And you see this all the time, text on the screen, somebody reading it out. No, mm. don't do this. Uh, but so the extraneous thing, redundancy I've talked about, keeping things close, you know, that idea that, you know, if you're going to be talking about this particular feature on a graphic, make sure the label is right there and it, there's an arrow pointing to it, as opposed yep. to that stuff's over here, the description of the text is over here, and you're, what you're talking about is over there. Uh, don't make people work too hard on the screens. Another really interesting set of findings was about tone. And, uh, you know, if you're if you have a presenter on video, try and personalize it. Be relaxed, you know, be yourself. Don't try to be like a newsreader <laughs> because, mm -hmm. it, as it turns out, actually, using the first and second person language, you know, me, us, we, you, is far better uh, for learning. And uh, you, you can test this, and indeed he did. A more conversational style he recommends, which often people fail to do. You see this in video and MOOCs all the time, people mm. pretending to be presenters almost when they don't have those skills. Uh, and so we have loads of lessons here. I mean, we're really, there are so many, we really can't go into it. But I'll give you a really brilliant one to show you how odd and really interesting this can be. When you're shooting video and you're showing somebody how to do something, a typical video director from television would shoot at third party. They'd have a camera up here, and I'd be doing something with my hands here, and they shoot down. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Wrong. He's saying it's far better to have the camera where my head is. So if I'm doing something here with my hands, the camera should be looking at it as performed by me, the, the user and learner. So you mm -hmm. reverse, reverse it in video. And you did the experiment, and sure enough, you get increased retention. So it's full of brilliant hints and tips on video text how to design things in the screen and i think his influence has been immense i'm you know i've met richard he's a, such a nice guy as well you know he's oh. very self-effacing uh, and you know I, I, when i was talking to him so you know you've changed this whole world for people like me because you gave us you've been the guiding light you know you've given us this solid bedrock of research upon which good stuff could be built unfortunately far too many people don't read it don't take these lessons we know from research on board and just bash our head with the whole edutainment thing, you know, more tainment than edu, unfortunately, most a lot of the time. So we get over-engineered content. Yeah, I think quite often as a marketing person, I, I get involved in discussions about what can um, learning people learn from marketing. And I think I would say, well, there's a point at which, you know, marketing and learning really diverge in their aims and techniques. And Mayer's work for me really points up the areas where it's different because a lot of what he says is exactly the opposite to what you would do in a marketing context. I think that's very interesting. Seems to be mostly right. Are there any criticisms of Mayer, any kind of shortcomings to his, his approach, would you say? Yes, there, there are those who think that his experiments were a bit simplistic in terms of the sort of stake drawings and so on, the type of material he presented. I don't think that's a valid criticism at all, actually, because... Uh, with a lot of the experiments were much more sophisticated in terms of the media they presented the, than those critics would allow. But I think the bigger one is, should we take all this? Uh, I mean, an interesting one is, don't present these as absolute rules. And I think that criticism is fair. Yeah. For example, if you have come up with a piece of research, and there are pieces of research saying, talking heads on video don't really work. I think that's generally true. If you have too much talking head that goes on for an hour in a lecture, then quite clearly, cognitively, it's going to, the transience effect shows that it doesn't work. You know, mm. it, it, it passes through your brain without enough time for you to process it. Yeah, said one talking head and the other one nodded in agreement. <laughs> yes, yes. The, so there's still room for talking heads. You know, in other words, these rules are never absolute. And that's an important point here. There are, it's just like filmmaking. You often break the rule to make a point. You know, I think that's, that, that's mm. one angle in here. But sometimes, you know, uh, people can take this stuff too seriously mm. because engagement and motivation also matters. There is a point to making things look good because people feel good about it. And we're coming to that with uh, Donald Norman uh, later in this podcast. The way we work has changed and the way we learn is changing too. But 70% of organisations don't feel that their learning systems can really cope with all this change. It seems there is a disconnect 
between what learners need right now and what most learning suites provide. In a new white paper, Ben Betts and I tell the story of how this disconnect happened and lay out a vision of what a modern learning system ought to be and do. It's called Sweet Dreams and you can read it now. So Clifford Nass and Byron Reeves, uh, a twofer here, Clifford Nass, 1958 to 2013, so died relatively recently. Um, he was a professor of communication at Stanford University, an authority on human computer interaction, which becomes a very important thing during this period. Born in New Jersey, first degree in maths at Princeton, quite a lot of maths among this group, mathematicians, fundamentally yeah. here. They worked for IBM and Intel on computer graphics, data structures, and database design. Uh, and the other one of the two is Byron Reeves, still with us, no birthday available anywhere I can find. Some of the, um, today's academics seem to be very good at hiding their birthdays, possibly <laughs> because they're coming towards the end of their careers and don't, don't want anyone to notice that, oh, maybe we should retire them. Mind you, they have tenure, I suppose. Um, <laughs> Also a Stanford professor, Byron Reeves. Interestingly, his first degree was in graphic design. Um, his research includes message processing, social cognition, and social and emotion responses to media. The two of these were linked together by their authorship of a seminal work that I've heard you refer to quite often, Donald, The Media Equation. So tell us about that and why it's so important. Yes, I think this is a central reading for people involved in learning design. So the, the full title is The Media Equation, How People Trust Computers, Television and New Media. Uh, uh, sorry, how people treat, it wasn't trust, how people treat computers, television and new media like real people and places. And other words, when we get a smartphone or watch television, it's almost as if the technology is another person. It's like when, you know, you got a flat tire and you kick the tire, you almost blame the tire itself. He said, this is a natural a cognitive feature, it's true of all technology, and that we should ignore this at our peril. And this is the beauty of this book, it has 35 studies, and the 35 studies have things like politeness, you know, how do you greet people when you use technology to learn? How do you let go and thank them and say goodbye at the end and so on? And I mean, to go back to that principle, which they explain in detail, I mean, it's, it's obvious that this happens. You know, if you watch a ventriloquist, within a second, you believe that the little dummy on the ventriloquist's knee is a real person. The ventriloquist mm. is a piece of technology, regarded as a yeah. proxy for technology. And so we're almost immediately entranced and, uh, you know, fooled into thinking it's got human-type qualities. This is both a danger and a huge benefit. Mm. So that's what the book is about. But if we then drill down to the 35 studies, because... Some of these studies were astonishing and are still massively uh, important today. Uh, if, I think the first thing is if we fail, if we avoid this issue of seeing technology as being human, we are unlikely to design good technology because you have to sort of design as if it were something speaking to the learner. That's the premise behind all this. Uh, and for example, the, you know, the, the the whole idea of learning objectives at the beginning of every module is just bizarre. And of course, Nass and Reeves would say, are you kidding? Why would you bore people to tears with a list of training speaker objectives at the beginning of a learning experience? Mm. That's absolutely the last thing you should be doing. You should be treating them as adults and human beings and, uh, you know, and, and getting into the content. You know, that's what they want. So you need mm. that emotional engagement at the beginning. So they, they did some work on what matters at the beginning of a learning experience should be a positive, negative, a type of experience or not and then some really interesting nitty gritty stuff like avoid pauses you know the slight pauses latency weights unexpected events all those things if you have those in video or audio it causes a wee bit of sort of cognitive dissonance in the learner and they break out of the learning mm. so that audio video uh, you know synchronization is important when you're using animation and so on poor lip sync jerky delays all that's really destructive in learning Another interesting one that I like is that experts really matter. If it's an expert speaking to you about something, you're more likely to remember it because you think they're an expert. I quite mm. like that one, which yeah. which which plays towards getting real academics and real experts, you know, get them on into your learning experience. Some people, people like identifiable experts. Yeah, like yourself, Donald. Yeah, <laughs> well, hopefully, modestly. But the I think also on media, really important lessons here as well. 
and as an astonishing finding is people still don't take seriously. The quality of video really doesn't matter that lot. So they took video and made it quite grainy and horrible and then full hi-fi production. Didn't make any difference at all to the learning outcomes in terms of retention. Hmm. Audio, however, did. If you have poor audio, it has an inhibitory effect on learning. Now, the reason for this is that our perceptual apparatus, our eyes, are used to dealing with fog, lower light. You know, we adapt very quickly to those circumstances. But audio is different. We always, audio has evolved to deal with somebody speaking to us, you know, just a meter away, as it were. So we always expect high quality, high fidelity audio. So, mm. so spend your money on audio. And of course, this has come to pass with podcasts. Isn't it interesting that people have Absolutely, yeah. Well, yeah. People ask my advice it. about getting set up as a podcaster. And if they're going to do it on YouTube, I always say, well, look, put the money in the mic, buy an expensive microphone. Yeah. You know, like, um, because, because exactly because of that, because I got it from one of your blogs, I think. Yeah, that, that's right. So there's real practical things that you can lift from Nas and Reeves that really matter. Another really fascinating one is the size of the screen affects retention. Mm. So they had three screen sizes, a big, a medium, and a small one. Tested the same material, you know, gave the same material to learners, and then tested them afterwards. And there's a correlation between screen size and learning and retention. Isn't this interesting? Mm. So you learn more the bigger the screen. So all those people who think that mobile learning is a great thing for retention might want to think again. Mm. Uh, you know, now we have to be careful here because, of course, a screen on a mobile, when I hold it here, is as big as a screen in a television three and a half times yeah. away from I me. And, and mobiles are getting bigger. Uh, that's right. So it, so the size of the screen relative to what you see is the important point here. But still, mm. he has a point about little, you know, when people put little inserts of video on the screen, you've got your expert, a little thumbnail up on the top right-hand side, but it's wrong. He's saying, you know, that's not the, not the way one would want to do this. Yeah. And then some nice subtle effects like politeness matters. Isn't this an interesting thing? You know, in, in online learning, uh, and there's a famous, I don't know if this story is apocryphal or not, but when, uh, when Steve Wozniak showed the first Apple Mac screen to Steve Jobs, it just had the little prompt. Now, I'm old enough to remember when everything was a little green prompt. You didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. but you, sure you had to type stuff in to get stuff. And Steve Jobs and, and Steve Wozniak was so pleased with what he had done. And Steve Jobs turned around and said, you need the word hello there. And of course, Wozniak fought against this. What do you mean? It's a computer. And who was right? Of course, Steve Jobs was right. right. And of course, he's built an one of the biggest companies in the world, changed the life for millions of people because of that hello, being polite, being nice, being user friendly. Yeah. So he was absolutely spot on there. And, and Nassim Reeves really spotted this very early on with online learning. Be polite when you welcome people at the beginning of the experience and when they leave as well, you know, say thanks for your time, blah, 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 when, when they exit yeah. an experience. So with all, all respect of this, and to many, the, many more of those hints and tips in that one book. Okay, with all, with all respect to the man in the black polar neck sweater, I saw a film about him where he wasn't very polite to his employees <laughs> and, and even children. But I, I was really fascinated by that thing about politeness because I always assumed that it was invented in the 18th century, you know, century England. It, it was kind of a tool of uh, social dominance in, in, in a way. But actually, it, it turns out it's got a basis in science and we are polite yeah. to objects. People call their cars by names. And I'm thinking back to one of the first novels, Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. Um, he develops, an, a man on his own on a desert island develops an attachment to the to the to the things around him, the objects that um, he's able to kind of prolong his existence with. So I think that, that there's yeah. a lot in their work, a lot in their work for anybody who works with media. How is it specifically important to learning theory? Yes, I will. As I say, what 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 Mayer does, what Nass and Reeve do, and then we'll come on to Norman and Nielsen next yeah. is they take very specific topics. So they take the general principle, which you beautifully illustrated there through Robinson Crusoe or giving your car a name. You know, that was what Na Nas and Reeves regarded as the premise behind all of their studies. The idea that we, uh, we attribute, uh, you know, almost in an animistic fashion, human qualities to objects and technology. Uh, that's certainly the case. Entire religions are built on the back of that one. Uh, some would say all religions are built on that one, attributing you know some metaphysical god or whatever, or the devil. Uh, but I think it's important because all of these studies give you practical, nitty-gritty, fine-grained advice on what to do when you have that design 
task in front of you. And if you don't follow their advice, what they're telling you, plain and simple, is that maybe accidentally you will stop people from learning. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of the over-engineered online learning we've seen does precisely that. You know, you may want to be a wee bit careful in gamification because it may be that in acquiring the badges and chasing rubies and coins around mazes and so on, it's just so much cognitive overload uh, that it destroys the, the learning itself. And that's not, I'm not arguing against gamification. I think it can be done very, very well and has been, but the danger is what they're, what they're saying is do this, don't do that. And indeed in my book, it's, I've got lots of do's and don'ts based on all the research. Mayor mm -hmm. is the name uh, that comes up most often in my book when I'm justifying a do or a don't. So in every chapter of my book, I've got a, a list of do's and don'ts, nitty gritty advice that's based on this research. It's not what Donald says, it's what Mayor, Nassen Reeves, Norman, Nielsen say. So let's get on to Donald Norman. Um, I, I was a bit surprised that you didn't have Norman and Nielsen as a twofer. I mean, they have a company together and so on, but um, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you have reasons for that, which we're about to find out. So let's start with Donald Norman, yeah. um, 1935-still-alive. Uh, he's an American researcher, professor, and author. Norman is the director of the Design Lab at University of California, San Diego. His first degree was in electrical engineering, again, quite STEMI, from MIT. Uh, but he also has a PhD in psychology. He worked with Apple in the 90s, who you already mentioned in this episode. He's a giant of usability and user-centered design, a term he introduced. Um, and now we more often talk about UX. I mean, this is where it begins with him and Nielsen. He's co-founder of Nielsen Norman, Norman Group. And he's best known perhaps for his book, The Design of Everyday Things. Donald, tell us about him. Yeah, so, I mean, I really love uh, uh, Donald Norman. His books are actually quite difficult to read and you know, a bit bitty in many ways, but, I think he looks at the space between us as humans and technology and goes, what should be in the middle? How do you mediate this stuff to make it work? And that's such an important issue when you're trying to teach people because learning is hard, teaching is hard. And he has, a, again, he has a nice premise here, which is the more invisible that interface of technology should be, the better. In, ideally, you want the technology to be completely invisible so that you can focus on the task or learning. And that would be the idea. So that was the idea behind this user-centered design. You know, think of the user first because you have these sort of crippling res restraints. If you've got a bad interface, it sort of destroys the learning before you've even started there. People are so puzzled and confused and full of dissonance because they can't get to grips with this stuff on the screen. So confusing menus, whizzy graphics and all that stuff suddenly, you know, suddenly becomes a, a destructive force in learning. So I think also he was very interesting here because he doesn't really say, he doesn't follow this sort of, it could be a bit of a tedious mantra, always think of the learning first technology second. No, no, he said, no, think about the technology. The technology itself does matter. You know, it, science, engineering, and all that stuff has produced this technology. That has lots of agency and potency. Let's not imagine it's just about learning in a way because technology has facets that we as designers have to understand as well. And so, you know, all that negative that you get around technology, you know, he, he, he's, he's certainly not a skeptic on that front. But let's come to the big book, because the big book that started it all off was The Psychology of Everyday Things. And it's a beautiful book because he just points to obvious things like, you know, the steering wheel in a car. If you turn right, you want a steering wheel that turns right when you go right. But there are lots of things in life where you do the opposite, you know, where it asks you to do something and something else happens. You're a bit puzzled by that, you know? And I was, which direction should you roll the window up in a car? Should it be clockwise or anti-clockwise? All that sort of stuff. So it, 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 this idea of building design into everyday objects was the subject of that amazing book. Uh, but he then goes on to give some real, uh, you know, practical advice around this, on designing for usability, usability being the big word for him. Yeah. And I was, uh, make things visible. Do, although you want the technology to be hidden, if you want them to do something, make it nice and big and bold and easy for them to use it. For example, he wasn't too keen on icons for abstract ta tasks, you know, because the user going, what is that? What's that icon mean? Just give them the word, <laughs> you know? Uh, give, if, you're, if they're unfamiliar with the task, then give them the word. There's no problem with this. And he had this methodology called mapping, which, you, which means that 
you know, you map the task in the real world, like the steering wheel of a car. If you've got to turn right, then you design a wheel that makes you turn right and almost uses your whole body to turn right in the car. And we don't think about a steering wheel as being a beautiful example of design, but it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you've ever driven a forklift truck where you have to turn the wheel in the opposite direction which the forklift goes, you'll know <laughs> how problematic that can be. It wasn't a given. And uh, he has this... He has this advice about using conventions, and this is true of Krug and many other theories in UX design. Stick to the conventions. You know, if you're going to have video controls, don't design your own icons. Make sure that, you know, the double arrow means fast forward, double arrow back. The two, two vertical stripes mean pause. We, everybody understands those. Don't go into inventing your own thing, which you see a lot in e-learning. It's okay to make those things look good, uh, but really the core sign as it were and meaning should be left intact so conventional usage was terribly important don't violate violate those conventions okay and then as i say use words to describe actions don't be scared of using words because it doesn't look good that's not the point it's how do you make things easy and actionable for the learner that matters and then he has a thing called coherence make sure that your own navigational structure is coherent and consistent across the whole learning experience and suddenly your icons appear here and then suddenly they're over here and up in the top left hand corner no keep things consistent but i th I, I think there's a much bigger side i've separated him out from nielsen because he has another angle to him which is the three forms of emotional design which is really now quite famous uh, you know, as a topic, the oldest thing about empathy and uh, learning and design thinking. And he is remarkably unorthodox on this. Uh, I don't think many people have read Donald Norman. I see people quoting Donald Norman and then talk about design, design thinking and empathy. But I don't think they quite understood what Donald Norman said about this. He believed there were three big things in, in emotional design. Doesn't matter what type of technology you're using. One is the visceral appearance of the stuff. How does it, you know, your first impressions. The second one is the behavioral performance. What have you got to do to move through this experience? And the third is this reflective or memories and experience of, of it's like a Venn diagram and they all, interact, all intersect in the middle to give you the perfect usability experience. Hmm. Now, I'll come to those in a minute, but he said something really interesting. He thinks that Americans value the first two Whereas Europeans have uh, 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 are very different. They value, they, you know, the visceral experience, as it were, matters more to Europeans than it does Americans. They're much more, they're much keener on the behavioral functionality of things. And I think he's absolutely right on here. I think there are cultural differences with regard to usability, which people don't realize. But that was a side point here. I think the the big message he gives is that empathy doesn't matter. I'll repeat that, empathy doesn't matter because it's such an astounding sentence. I see presentations all the time about learning designers having to be empathetic towards learners. And what he says is, well, you're kidding yourself on here. You know, if you've got a program in plumbing and you're a 23 year old English language, uh, you know, English literature graduate, don't imagine for one minute that you're gonna have the empathetic skill to imagine what it's like to be a plumber fixing a sewage pipe. It's just not gonna happen. Neither is it useful. <laughs> and this is a really interesting uh, line here. It said, that, it said that the whole concept of empathy, not only is it impossible for you to do this, even if it were possible, it's completely wrong. It's not the sort of thing that you need when you're designing learning experiences. It sounds wonderful. It sounds as though you're being nice to the learner and it's very le learner centric, but his exact words were, the search for empathy is simply misled. He thinks it's completely wrong-headed. And I actually agree with him. It's not that it's not possible uh, to understand individuals or your learners, but do the analysis. And what, what he says is, do the hard work here. You know, the point is, it's not empathy you need, but data. What is the task? So you have really brilliant theorists like Richard Clark and so on, and Guy Wallace and you know, there's a whole squad of people who say, listen, look at the job, break the task down, understand what they have to do before you start empathizing with them as human beings in any sense. And he said that most learning is like that. You have to understand what they need to learn and retain. Uh, and if you don't do that, you're kidding yourself on in many ways. And of mm. course, there's a fundamental truth here. Most of the e-learning I see, you know, you say, well, you've got empathy with these adult learners. Next thing you've got some cartoon images on the screen, you know, and it looks as though it's the Disneyfication of learning, you know, it's a sort of CBs, you know, something you've got in children's TV or something, you know. So I think there's a lot of 
false consciousness he's got you know or, or, or you know false belief about the efficacy of empathy and that's confirmed by by donald norman and i think mm. it's something uh, we need to sort out in the learning world because i think there's a lot of vacuous talk about what the design process should be. Again, I covered this right at the beginning of the book, my book. I'm saying, you know, listen to what people who have done the experimental work say about this. There are many, many different ways you can unpack the design process, you know, ADI methods, uh, agile methods, design thinking methods. And they, they're all suitable in their own way for different types of projects. But there are experts that show us how to do this mm. uh, and uh, don't imagine that it's all about just making yourself feel good because you think you know the learners. Do the hard work. Okay, let's move on to the uh, second half of that partnership, uh, which is a commercial partnership, I suppose rather than an academic one, um, Norman and Nielsen. Jakob Nielsen, born 5th of October 1957, so contemporaneous with us, Donald and more or less, and um, still around. A Danish web usability consultant, human computer interaction researcher, and co-founder of the Nielsen Norman Group, of course. He was named the guru of web page usability in 1998 by the New York Times, and the king of usability by Internet Magazine. I've read, a, I've, I've led, I should say, I've led a number of um, web design projects and, and built a number of sites. Um, and if any of them have been of any use to people over the years, it's almost completely down to Jakob Nielsen because I was forced to read his stuff by a web designer back in the, the, the late 90s and followed his blogs ever since. And a lot of really common sense um, advice. So this is one of these learning theorists. I've actually read Donald <laughs> quite a bit of. Um, <laughs> it's an embarrassing admission there straight away. Um, but I've often thought he's the person you'd least like to get caught with at a party because there's this kind of intense focus on um you know good and bad examples of of usability uh which i'm sure he'd, he'd buttonhole with you perhaps, perhaps that's unfair he's probably a you know a very wonderful empathetic person a phd in human computer interaction comes to the fore here um which later feeds into things like digital anthropology he's worked with sun microsystems as a Microsoft, sun microsystems distinguished engineer and with ibm um, he has usability heuristics, rules of thumb for usability, and a Nielsen's law, which is less well known than Moore's law, but uh, I think quite an important one. He says that, I think if I'm getting it right, that uh, the amount of uh, bandwidth and so on available to a consumer um, moves at a slower rate than Moore's law. So uh, consumers are always, members of the general population, are always going to be going to be lagging behind what the machines can do in terms of their ac access to bandwidth. So they're constrained in bandwidth. And that is always throwing uh, the importance on UX and usability. So that's my <laughs> piece on Nielsen, but give us yours, Donald, which I'm sure which would be much yeah, more Yeah, an interesting observation. Almost, he was so obsessed by detail, Nielsen, you can, you can imagine that the skill is one of the pedant and the bore. <laughs> so I can see your point about not wanting to go out to the pub with him. Yeah. Uh, that, but uh, I haven't met him, that would be an unfair slur. I'm sure he's a nice guy. And I, I like you, I built a big usability lab, you know, that, uh, you know, it was a company itself called the Epicenter, and we had racked kits, you know, wall-to-wall, -wall, all networked, and we tested everything, browsers, usability, accessibility, and so on. And Nielsen was the guiding light. And it wasn't just the, the guiding light on what you should do in terms of using eye tracking and heat spotting and all that sort of modern, all these modern gizmos for usability design. He really pushed something which I think is still incredibly useful today. And that is getting real users to use your content and get them to voice as they use it. In other words, to understand what's going on in their head, especially the obstacles they hit in your online learning experience, get them to tell you, but get to them to tell you while they're doing it. And just ask them to speak to you and record it and take notes. And you do that two or three times with an interface expert and you get this massive increase in the efficacy of the experience. And he's right. So think, get the users, real users to think aloud. Also use interface experts as well, because that he also thought that mattered. But the thing I liked about Nielsen is he, again, like uh, Donald Norman, thought that 
he was craving for this best practice. And again, like Norman, he thought that consistency mattered. Don't surprise the user. You don't want to make them feel insecure by doing something that's a bit odd, you know, and that takes them away from the learning experience. So all of these interfaces that he recommended, or the design of the interfaces, should be really easy to learn. They should be efficient, easy to remember across the experience. So, so you're nice and consistent. You don't have to rely on them changing their mind on something, so keep it consistent. With vet, and also measure for low error rates. Make sure that when you test it, you measure the error rate. Do users do something wrong? That's not going to be them. It's down to you, as it were. And what is the satisfaction with the user about the whole experience? So he had a sort of methodology around UX design, which I think is important. But he also went in a lot more detail than Donald Norman, I think, on what you present on the screen, as it were. And he was very precise on text, for example. He was really keen on headings and subheadings, bulleted lists and not big slabs of text, highlighting the keywords, short paragraphs, a really simple writing style, and defluffing your language, getting rid of the jargon. He thought, oh, you know, this is really concrete advice. Again, I got a whole chapter in my book on this, and it's all based on that sort of Nielsen, cut it till it bleeds, cut it again, make sure the language is nice and simple and conversational. And then, of course, he backs us up with his heat maps and gaze plots and all that sort of stuff. But I think Nielsen was particularly useful in pointing to things that were bad. And not many young people will remember this, but there was a thing called Flash that came out of Adobe. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wrote a very famous article, which Adobe were not too keen on, called Flash, 99% bad. And Flash was a usability disaster, to be honest, because it sort of locked everything in a single file. It was terrible in accessibility. You couldn't change it easily. So the problem with Flash that it, it actually gets in the way of users, he thought. So he had an attack. Thankfully, Flash is almost gone, although you still see it pop up now and again. Oh, but his other big one was yeah. on accessibility. And here he was incredibly useful. But he was useful in an interesting way. Now, accessibility is a huge issue, and it's a demand that we make things accessible. And when you mean accessible, you don't just mean for people, let's say, with visual impairment or hearing impairment or, phys or, or physical uh, uh, problems, uh, because that could be solved by text-to-speech, text speech-to-text, and so on. He thought that actually the accessibility issue was more to do with people who have learning difficulties. That's a much bigger population. In fact, I have visual impairment. I'm wearing glasses. I also have learning difficulties. I forget stuff. The older I get, I forget stuff all the time. So everybody has learning difficulties. And so he called for what he called a accessibility, a pragmatic approach. And he was saying, don't apply the accessible rules in such a way that they destroy the learning for the majority of the people taking the experience. I mean, if you're building a flight simulator, let's say, for flying an aircraft, you're not going to put, apply accessibility rules about blindness. I mean, we're not going to have blind people flying aircraft, <laughs> commercial aircraft. So, uh, but that was actually happening. And I, you still see some examples of this where you see, you know, the, the accessibility rules has destroyed the learning experience. Whereas the people who really have some of those impairments already have really useful assistive technology, text to speech, speech to text, that does this separately anyway. So his point was that let's be a wee bit pragmatic on accessibility. And I think he was spot on with this because you can spend a huge amount of your budget on accessibility on a tiny number of people who have the assistive technology anyway, whilst destroying or minimizing the effect of your learning because you haven't spent the money on the right things. As it were. Hmm. And so I think he was also, you know, the, you know, including control groups and listening to users on accessibility. This was a, this was a big deal here, I think. And he, he invented this whole science, and therefore we should pay attention to it because, by and large, he was right. And he picked up on something, I think, that was really useful here, which was bad search. He was the first to really lay this on the line for me. Actually, in most learning experiences, most let people learn by just they, they hit something, they have a challenge, and they go off and search Google or Google mm. Scholar if you want a piece of research, or YouTube, you search on YouTube, uh, or you search on Amazon for a book or whatever. He thought that search was incredibly important and that the big problem in most learning design is bad internal search. In other words, if I want to find something in my organization or university, I should be able to find it by simply typing it in. But try that, because most search doesn't actually interrogate inside documents or your HR mm. policies. It just hits the meta tagging or the titles. So this has now been a really useful thing because it shaped this whole LXP world, you know, and it was powerful search, search which actually interrogates inside videos, for example, 
So mm. it, it, it searches the transcript of the video. It searches inside images. It, it searches inside documents. He was the first to say, this is a design issue. If you're bad search, you're bad design. And that the most useful data you get from useful from learners is what they type into the search box, because mm. that's what you've not done. If they're searching for it, you've not given them it. <laughs> and therefore, that's the, probably the most interesting set of data you're going to gather uh, from mm. learners or, or users. Oh, fascinating stuff. And of course, these guys did this, you know, decades ago. It's not, this is not all new. People think UX design is a recent thing. No, it's not. It's been around, uh, you know, for 40, 50 years. Uh, there is a thing in uh, that the Bjorks pointed out about uh, desirable difficulties that learning at some point has to be difficult. Uh, now, some people have said perhaps there is a conflict with UX, which is to try and make things as easy as possible. Is there a conflict or is it just the difficulties should be in a different place? No, I think there are two different things there. You know, a, a Donald Norman Nielsen and I would certainly agree that on um, UX then you want it to be as invisible as possible. So this is why, you know, AI and all this stuff has been used. If you watch Netflix, you know, it's not giving you dashboards. It's not, it's not making any, you know, the interface is so easy to use now. It's simply, we can do it one-handed with our thumb. We can select, we can even search for a movie that we want to find because you've got that lovely scrolling. And anyways, you've got that limited real estate of a screen. The Netflix interface scrolls vertically for different layers of topics, let's say horror movies, whatever, and then horizontally for more of the same. Everybody knows this information, uh, this interface, which is why it's now being used in learning. And all those people who diss the Netflix are learning, yeah, right. And then you go home and use it at night, every night to watch movies. The interface is great. Uh, and that's what a lot of interfaces have moved towards because it's consistency and the whole world globally knows what that interface is. But it's nice and easy and as invisible as possible because all the hard work is done behind the interface. The AI is determining what you'll see in a tiled fashion on the screen. So every individual on Netflix gets a different screen. So I, Donald, I'm sitting here in England, I, I don't get just Bollywood movies if I were perhaps a Bollywood fan. Uh, you know, I get the things that I want to explore and see. So AI is the invisible hand that's that's really creating the interfaces and the re and it's not really about how beautiful the interface looks any longer. It's about the invisible nature of the technology. And that, so it's a very opposite of deliberate difficulty. You want to make it invisible. Deliberate difficulty is about challenging you cognitively on something you have to learn so that you have deeper processing and remember it later on and can apply it in the real world. But operating the interface shouldn't challenge you cognitively. That should be no, as not all, no. perfect and simple a process possibly be. That's right. It should be almost automatic and unconscious, like, you know, when you get to learn, drive a good car. You know, you, you drive the car and you almost do it unconsciously, you know, and you can talk to the person in the passenger seat as you're doing amazingly complicated things. That's the way all this is going because the car is doing a lot of the work for you. You know, you in fact... You know, this thing about dashboards, you hardly ever have dashboards on the car now. It's only got about two dials mm. <laughs> because nobody needs to know that stuff. Uh, and yet, oh, as learning people, you know, we think data should be turned into 40 histograms, three donuts and a pie chart. <laughs> Can you imagine driving that car with that on your dashboard? Uh, data should be used to automate processes and interfaces. And of course, the great example is, uh, is voice interfaces with AI. So that's made... I mean, I have, I, I, the first thing I do when I, I wake up in the morning, I go, I just say, Alexa, news. And Alexa delivers the news to me. And uh, uh, and then when I get up, whether I have timers, in fact, I had a timer for this today. And there has Alexa just sparked off the news. Alexa, stop. <laughs> it does work. <laughs> uh, I think the, okay. the, I think the, you know, this is, this is the important thing. And, these two theorists led the way on this. Time to sum up now, but perhaps before we do that and go back to where we started this episode with, with Papa, um, maybe just a peek at where it's heading now. What, 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 what is the future? Because we, we're, we're very much up to date with this stuff now. So what's the future look like? The good news is that people are getting very savvy about online learning and design and everything's getting better as we speak, apart from this over-egging. If everything's just a busy entertainment experience, that's a danger. 
And that, that's really why I wrote that book on learning experience design. Let's focus on learning. Let's look at the research. Let's tell us what the research says about the do's and don'ts and uh, design and learning design. But there's a really interesting thing that I've become almost obsessed with over the last few years around AI and learning theory and technology and how one is influencing the other. And this is quite bizarre in many ways. So we have this guy called Donald Hebb who comes along. Now, he is a, a neuropsychologist. And he's trying to figure out how the brain works. And, and he wants to create something that mimics the brain in order to understand it. And he comes up with this thing called Hebbian learning. In other words, he has a theory. It's often characterized in the phrase neurons that fire together, wire together. In other words, he comes up with a theory of learning that turns out to be actually reasonably accurate. He didn't get the mechanisms right because you have between neurons, you have uh, chemical reactions, which he didn't know about. He thought it was all electrical, nevertheless. Hmm. It, he comes up with a theory that has a mathematical model of neurons and neural networks. Great. You know, what, what a breakthrough. Suddenly, we're applying a learning theory to understanding the brain itself. And he builds this as a mathematical model. Then two guys come along called McC uh, McCulloch and Pitts, uh, and they go one step further. They build... They have this amazing paper that they write in 1943, and they're the first to create a mathematical model of the neuron, inspired by the concept of a biological neuron. They actually do, they build a model that's got all the logic of and and not and or, all the sort of traditional things you'd find in thinking and logical thinking, and build it into a model around a neural network. So suddenly we're creating software that actually does what the brain does. Okay, then you have a guy called Frank uh, Rosenblatt who comes along and he builds a thing called the, uh, the perceptron and that actually learns. So suddenly you have a neural network just like us, a piece of technology or a piece of maths, a piece of software that is a learning machine. And of course, this is the huge breakthrough now into neural networks, layered neural networks that people like Jeffrey Hinton come along. He's a British Canadian cognitive psychologist, interestingly, who looks at learning theory and looks at a thing called back propagation. Don't worry too much about that. Uh, it, but it's a method for training multi layer neural networks. And this is what Dennis Hassabis and DeepMind, who they were bought for, you know, 650 million years ago by Google, and now found, forms the foundation of Google. The tools we use every day, the AI technology, and all that search. All that stuff we see come from deep learning, neural networks, reinforcement learning. The word learning crops up in AI all the time because it's software that learns. We used to have a very simple world, a world of teachers and human beings as learners. We now have human teachers, human learners. We now have software teachers and software that learns. <laughs> you know, so the new mm. kids on the block, as it were. But boy, do we have to pay attention to this because suddenly learning theory is in the software. Hmm. Isn't that odd? It's the software that learns, but it can learn to our advantage because, you know, when I'm using the A-L-E-X-A, I'm not going to spark her off again, hmm. then every time we use it, it's getting better. You know, as I said, she, that anthropomorphic thing that Nassim yeah. talked about earlier, you know, I, I regard her as a person, as it were. Uh, yeah. And I think as we go on, we'll find that technology will play a much bigger role in solving many of the problems which these theorists have stated and that's you know i wrote a whole book on this called ai for learning and it was all about this it was all about how learning theory all this stuff should be invisible let the ai handle this let mm. ai take the load of teachers and instructors and trainers and let learners have a much more sophisticated personalized experience and we can mm. focus on the learning then so you've begun to sum up there and with your mention of perceptrons takes us back to papert where we started yes you've read a book with Marvin Minsky called Perceptrons right. in 1969. So what's, what's your elevator pitch for this group? <laughs> or, you know, the opposite of an elevator pitch, because it, it, it's your considered <laughs> reflection in 25 words <laughs> or, or more. All right, okay. Well, I think the first thing is that, you know, think about it, this learning stuff really matters. The psychology of learning really matters when you're dealing with psychology, dealing with technology. You have to think deeply. And I don't mean you think deeply. Go back to the people who did all the hard work and the research for us. So go back to Mir, go back to Nielsen, go back to Norman, go back to Nass and Reeves, because they really did all the hard work here and have given us plenty of evidence 
about what works and just as importantly, what doesn't work. Uh, and we ignore that at our peril. So I think it's really important that, you know, we, if we're using video and learning, for example, and I'll just end on this, you know, don't imagine that video is a great learning medium on its own because it's not, you know, we tend, it has this transition, uh, you know, this transience effect. If you test people afterwards, they don't remember a lot. If I asked you what the second episode of the last box set you watched was, you probably can't remember even the name of the episode or anything about that episode because video doesn't have that deep learning facet to it. Nevertheless, it's useful for emotional and attitudinal shifting. What you have to do is supplement the video with stuff. So we're, now all of that's in the research. It's all in the research. But if you ignore it, you're going to make a mistake in thinking that just showing people videos is the way in which people learn. But nobody has ever got a degree in mathematics by just watching videos. Nobody's got a degree in anything by just watching videos. So we, ha we, have to be, we have to pick up on the research and apply it. But that means a bit of work. You know, it means that learning designers have to read this stuff. You don't have to read all the original academic papers. You can take shortcuts, like listen to these podcasts, for example, oh. or read books on learning experience design, you know, when I've just published or whatever. You know, there are shortcuts. You don't have to go back to the raw academic data. There are pe plenty of people like myself who are mediating this stuff to, to help to oil the wheels, as it were. Well, that's a good place to end, that's I what think. these podcasts are doing, John. You know, it was the purpose behind them, wasn't it? To to try and get that massive research over 2,500 years into a digestible form for people. Hmm. Uh, hopefully it has been digestible. I feel now like we should be offering a quiz at the end of the season. <laughs> we are heading towards that. Um, we have one more in this season to go, but um, many more seasons projected. Uh, so thank you very much for that, Donald. Thank you, John. This season of Great Minds on Learning is brought to you by Learning Pool, the company that helps you deliver exceptional performance with pioneering online learning platforms, creative content and powerful analytics. For a wealth of valuable free white papers and resources on learning, visit learningpool.com forward slash downloads. Great Minds on Learning comes from the Learning Hack team and is produced by John Helmer. Sound edit is by Isaac Peacock. Social media by Jay Curtis. The podcast is based on a series of blog posts written by Donald Clark and would like to thank Donald for his kind collaboration in this project. In our next episode, the last of the season, we go back several centuries to discover one of learning's grand narratives as we explore what the thinkers of the Enlightenment have to tell us about learning. Be sure not to miss it. <laughs>